Hi, this is Tom Pizzato. I'm Vicki Hodges. From SpyMovieNavigator.com. And today we're cracking the code of the just-released spy movie, Black Widow. I didn't think I was going to like this movie, as I'm a spy movie fan, and I'm not a fan of the MCU. Boy, was I wrong. I really like Black Widow, and I think you will too. We're going to do this by taking a quick-fire look at the movie. The goal of our quick fires are to give you a spoiler-free look at the movie since we do them right after the movie's released, so we won't go into too many details on the movie itself. We'll talk about if we liked it. We'll talk about where it may have been influenced by either real-life things or previous movies and give you an idea if it's something worth your time. I want to start up front with a warning for you. If you're like me, I came in as a spy movie fan, not an MCU fan. And I have a friend of mine who's a very big MCU fan. And I forgot, he told me two years ago, or after the closing credits, they have a scene. And I totally forgot about that. So we left during the credits. And Vicky, there was a scene at the end, and I think people probably should have seen it, correct? Yeah, you just need to sit there and just watch all the names scroll down the screen <laughs> for about, what, two or three minutes, right to the very end, and then you will get a scene which will lead into something in the future. I can't believe I was so stupid because I read something about the ending and I went, oh man, I forgot Anthony told me that. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So let's kind of talk again, non-spoiler as we can, about what this movie was, the plot of this. So again, I'm coming to this from a non-MCU fan in fact, prior to seeing the movie, I had only seen two of them. I watched the prior two MCU movies the day before, and then I saw this. I went to this because it was supposed to be a spy movie. And since we're a spy movie navigator, this definitely made sense for me to do. I did not want to look at it as an MCU movie, nor did I want it to be like the Avengers. I hate those movies where they've got characters that morph into things. Or, or, or animals that are taking on human-like roles. And there's some of that in the Avengers, and that's why I don't like Star Wars. It's, that's not what I like. And fortunately and happily for me, this movie isn't that. This movie was a spy movie. Yeah, the end fight scene, there's always an end fight scene. That was a little MCU-ish, but it didn't have all these goofy characters in it. So I really like this movie. What about you, Vicky? I actually rate this one of the higher films in the Marvel run of films because of the spy element. It's essentially a, a prequel set after the events of uh, Captain America's Civil War. But if you aren't, as Thomas said, a MCU fan, you can go and see this as a standalone film. You don't need to have seen any of the other films to enjoy this one. Yeah, I mean, it's about the, the whole thing's about Natasha Romanoff, mm -hmm. who's, who's a spy in the MCU, and it's really about her adventures. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's essentially a, her origin movie, the origin of her character, yeah. like we've had with Wolverine and a number of other characters. This is her origin. She's a trained assassin, and it shows you how she leads to this. And the timing of it's weird to me because, like I said, I watched the last two Avengers movies before I saw this, and she appeared to die in the Avengers Endgame. So I'm like, why are we seeing her as a young person and then now as an adult when I thought she died? I thought that was weird timing-wise. Well, as I say, they, when they do these origin-type films, they want to show you where it starts and, you know, what influences things that happen to her, as we've seen in our older presence. Mm -hmm. I can't rate it highly enough, to be honest with yeah. you. In fact, I'm, I would like to see it again. Yeah. That's how much I like it. Yeah, I, I was shocked that I liked it as much as I did. And when I say that, I'm not degrading it at all because I really liked it. Yeah, so. yeah. And it has so so many influences of other films. Absolutely. That it draws on. And, and you, you find yourself sitting there going, ah, ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's, what, that's what I found myself doing. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you talk a little bit about some of those influences? With, again, without giving the scenes away in Black Widow, Let's talk about some of the movies that might have influenced Black Widow. Yeah, I mean, key ones, you've definitely got Bond in there. Yes. Um, lots, lots of things for Bond, to be honest with you. Uh, you've also got uh, a little well, bit of Mission Impossible. Actually, before you get to Mission Impossible, let's talk one, one second about Bond, because yeah. Natasha is sitting at home one night watching Moonraker. Yes. <laughs> so yes. That, mo 
That movie yeah, influences I, this one. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a key a key one for them to pick. Yeah. When you see something later on in the film. Yes. Yes, and that was one that went ah. I sort of nudged my other half. I went. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the locations. Mm-hmm. For me as well, he's yes. very much Bond. Lots yes. of locations throughout yes. the throughout the film. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and. I was sat there thinking, oh, has Bond been to here? And, as, you know, my mind was drifting off to other other places. Okay. What about On Her Majesty's Secret Service? I saw some influence there. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I, I didn't pick up on that. Okay. So uh, mm-hmm. what I will okay. say is what, was you gonna say? what Drakoff was doing, Drakoff's ah. big scheme, mm. has some influences from On Her Majesty's Secret Service in my mind. Yes. Yes, see, see, I'd also got that there was some influence of Moonraker in that as well. Yes, there, there absolutely was. a mixture was. Of, of the two, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, again, trying not to give it away, but saying that these are two films that we think influenced from the James Bond world, influenced this one. So now you were going to yeah. say something about Mission Impossible. Yes, there was a, a little bit of Mission Impossible in there, um, yeah. you know, just a, a, a couple of seconds, which took me to Mission Impossible. Oh, I would uh, t- I- immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, again, I, I think I leaned over and <laughs> said Mission Impossible. I also got a little bit of Star Wars in there from costume. I saw the first Star Wars and that's the only one I've seen. So yeah. uh, you, there's uh, a little bit of costume. Okay. Uh, and I think it might be a little bit of a nod to Star Wars, okay. which would be then a nod to Moonraker. Right. So it sort of crescendos on. <laughs> uh-huh. There was also a very big influence in my mind from the Jason Bourne trilogy, Mm. especially from Bourne Ultimatum. I really think there's a very important influence there. And if you're not a Bourne fan, you you might not pick it up. I watched that and I went back and watched the first three Bourne movies again because I couldn't remember which one it was in. (laughs) So it was in the third one. Huge, huge influence. Just just going back to Bond, you've pretty much, of course, got some very high-end stunts and mm-hmm. also that links to Mission Impossible. Yes. And, of course, a supervillain, which, again, is Bond. With a lair. Um, <laughs> but without copying, without really copying, it's more of a uh, homage to each of these things yeah, rather you can, than it just you can, being... You see influence without it saying yeah. we're copying yeah. it. Any other TV or movies that you came up with? Because I've got two more to talk about. Not for me. More, okay. more connections with perhaps the cast. Okay. That I'll we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about yeah. the cast in just a second. So there, there are two other things that I kind of wanted to point out from influences. And the first was there was a TV show called The Americans. I don't know where in the, where in the world it showed. You know, it was here in the U.S. I don't know where else you could yeah. see it. I don't want to give anything more away than that. But there is a very particular scene that was heavily influenced by that show. That show was based on real world events. This scene is a very heavy influencer of it. So if you're a fan of the Americans, when you see that scene, you're going to be, that's what Tom was talking about. And if you right, like the yeah, Americans, I, I do you like know it. of the program, but I haven't watched yeah. it myself. Okay. But I do know it's been highly spoke of. Yeah. Well, the last influence, and this is a stretch, especially because. <laughs> Drakoff has been around for a while. When I first heard it in the theater, I thought they were calling him Draco. Yes. That V wasn't there when I heard it. And it could yeah. just be because I was slanted that way. And if I think about in, in movies, you have Draco Malfoy, who was Harry Potter's big rival in the Harry Potter movies. Yeah. You've got Mark Ons Draco, who's the crime boss in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And then here, Drakoff is the villain. But there's this V. So again, I'm taking a stretch here, <laughs> okay? Yeah. I'm going to take some yeah. liberties here. So one of the translations of the word Draco is dragon. And if you look at Miriam Webster, under dragon, it talks about a violent, combative, or very strict person as a person, someone formidable or baneful. And I think those two nail Drakov here. But now here's where I go out on a ledge here. There's a game, a video game, that has a character called the Ultimate Dragon who's posted talking about the fact that there is a character called Drake in that video game, which is a lower class of dragon. The Russian translation of Drakov is Drake, at least according to Google. 
So is this whole dragon tie in part of it? I don't know, but I looked at it and thought that that could have influenced his name. But again, given that Drakoff has been around for a while, I don't know if that's valid. That was just something I picked up on. Yeah. Well, they sort of, you said Drakov and Drax. I mean, I know it's not yeah. quite the same, but it's going yeah. in the direction of as well. Yeah. The Drax from yeah. the Moonraker. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. I don't know what that translates to. That could be dragon as well for all. It could. For all I know. <laughs> um, so, one other thing before we get into the characters that I thought was kind of interesting was when you watched the previews when you were in the theater watching because the, you saw this in a the theater, right? Yes. Yeah. So did I. They didn't have a No Time to Die preview. They had the Kingsman, and almost everything was a Disney-based movie. So I think that might have been why they may have only been previewing their movies. I thought, ah, I now I did have no time to die. You did. Okay. So I did not. So. I only had that one. That's the only one I have. <laughs> oh, we had 25 minutes of previews in the U S that's, that's how they do. That's how they do it. They say the movie starts at 11 and the movie started at 11 25. Yeah. By the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so, all right. So let's go and talk about the cast. Obviously Natasha, the lead black widow with Scarlett Johansson yeah. taking that role forward. And I thought she did a great job here. My wife, the first thing she said when we got out of the theater was, Scarlett Johansson was really good in that. She, she's, a, she's a good actress, and I think she takes on that, that role well. Yeah. Um, it, it suits her, you know, and I think very yeah, and good. She, and she says this is her last go-around as Natasha, and given that we saw her die in Endgame, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, there's another character, and I'm only going to refer to the characters by the first name without telling you who they necessarily are, because if I do that, we'll be giving some of this yeah, away, yeah. especially the beginning of the movie. There's a character, Yelena, played by Florence Pugh, yeah. who I absolutely thought was fantastic in that role. Yeah, What'd I think, you think she was the standout, yeah. the standout person in the film. Yeah, now she also Brilliant. got the best lines in the movie. Yeah, she was just um, really good. She just looked good, yeah. and action scenes were good with her. She was funny, you know, yeah, yeah. she, yeah, she is. Yeah, so, Spot on casting there, spot yeah. on casting. With the way the before the ending credits ended, it kind of looked like maybe they'll have her back in other, in other roles or in other yeah. movies. I might want to go see those, even if they are the other kind of MCU movie. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> All right. So the, the next name then is David Harbour. Yes. Who, who plays a character called Alexi. Bond fans may remember him as Greg Beam, who is the section chief in, of the CIA. And, yeah. yeah. Um, he also... If you ever saw the movie Hellboy, he was Hellboy. He's he's in lots of things and he's been very good in everything. I particularly like him in Stranger Things. That's what I uh -huh. watch him in. And he's always very funny. <laughs> uh -huh. And he's, I must admit, he, without giving much away, he is the comedy element in this film. Yes. Yeah. He, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> and he, he played that really well, too. Yeah. yeah. yeah he did a good job with that. All right. Now, since I mentioned Quantum of Solace, another alum there. Olga Kirilenko, and she has a decent sized supporting role in the movie. Now, in Quantum of Solace, she played Camille. And if I didn't tell you she was in this movie, Black Widow, you might not recognize her. Now that I've told you she's in it, I bet you recognize her. I knew she was in the movie when I first saw her, and I didn't get that it was her. And then, like the second or third time you saw her, I was like, oh, yeah, that's her. Yes. Yeah. Did, did you recognize yes, her? Well, I, I must admit, I, I looked to see who was in the cast, but I didn't clock that her name was in this film. And when uh -huh. it came up on the screen, I was like, oh, okay, more <laughs> Bond people. I I just thought, I don't want to give too much, too much away, but, uh, but you don't see her straight off. So it was like, well, where, what character is she going to be? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, she wasn't, yeah. It was yeah, she wasn't recognizable role. at all initially. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. And then finally, we have Rachel Weiss, mm -hmm. um, who plays Melina. And, you know, she's always good, right? You may know her as Tessa Quayle in The Constant Gardener. She won a Best Performance by an Actress in a Supporting Role Oscar in 2006 for that role. And that was based on the John Le Carre novel. Bourne fans may know her as Dr. Marta Shearling from The Bourne Legacy, if you watched that one, which was the worst of the Bourne movies. But then a lot of people know her as Daniel Craig's wife. Yeah. And I only mention that because she was on one of the late night talk shows here in the U.S. And then I've seen it reported on since she talked about this. They were trying to figure out when do we release Black Widow in the theaters? We've got this No Time to Die monster 
that we're going to have to be up against at some point to some degree. How do we stay away from it? If we only knew what they really were going to do on the release. And Rachel said, I'm sitting there and I hear Daniel walking down the stairs. And she's like, I don't even know if these people realize it. I'm Daniel's wife. And I kept thinking to myself, well, do you want me to just ask Daniel? Because <laughs> it was like some super secret meeting they were having. I tried to figure out the planning of it. Well, I don't think I talked about Ray Winston. I'll be honest with you, I'm not a fan of Ray Winston. Okay. I think he he's good at playing a Cockney East End <laughs> gangster. Uh huh. But not so much in other things, doing other things. Uh, but I'm not I'm not going to take anything away from the performance that he he did. But he was probably for me the weakest of the of the okay. main characters. Okay. You know, I I thought he played a pretty good bastard. <laughs> and his role, he was Dracoff. I he's mentioned in other MCU movies, but I don't he was not in any of Dracoff no. the character wasn't in it, right? This is the first time you actually see Dracoff, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh and, and also there's a, a character in there called Mason. I uh, can't remember the actor's name, but it was a he was a good tie into Q from the Bond films. Yeah, the guy who could get the gadgets. Yeah. Yeah. Nope, that's good. Yeah, I like that. That's a good tie. There's one big thing for me there that we haven't talked about. And I love the preponderance of women's roles in this movie and how they did the women's roles in this movie. Yeah. Almost all of the fighting is done by women. And importantly, unlike some earlier MCU or other spy movies, they fought dressed like they were a spy fighting, not in a ninja costume, no high heels, no tight skirts, nothing like that. They were dressed for the role they were supposed to be doing. There was no, and there was none of this, I've almost got him, but I need a man to finish the job. There was none of that. These women were in charge. They took charge of what was up and they did their jobs. You didn't have any of the stuff we normally see there. And I think it's great, especially when I think about in No Time to Die, we see pictures of Paloma fighting in a dress. Yeah. If you saw the debacle of a movie in 2019, Charlie's Angels, sometimes I didn't know what the heck they were wearing. Here, the women had strong roles and they looked the part for the role they were playing. Yeah. Which yeah. I really thought was great. Yes. And it brought me to thinking about the fight scenes and how they were choreographed. Because mm -hmm. they were so entertaining. It, it yes. brought back, again, a couple of links to different films pretty much reminded me of John Wick and the fight mm -hmm. scenes, very yeah. stylized yes. fighting. And also elements of Kill Bill, I was almost thinking of. <laughs> yeah. Threw me off onto the, and that sort of, yeah. because she, she was quite a, you know, a powerful character um, right. um, in that film. And Absolutely. With what she got on, which is yep. similar to the things that we're seeing in, yes. this, in this film. Yep. Okay. So now you, you said you saw this in a movie theater. Yeah. And just as did I. But this has been released on a couple different formats in the movie. There's Super Screen, there's Dolby Cinema, there's IMAX, and then there's the more traditional theater format. Yeah. And so you saw it in more of a traditional theater format, correct? Yes. Yeah, so you, I did. So what, you had recliners, no, no Recli seat just, shakers? Yeah, just reclining seats, lots of, lots of leg room, lots of space, and the, the, uh, quite, a, quite a huge screen that yeah. curved. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, you saw it was a curved screen. It was okay. a curved screen, but it, okay. yeah, but it wasn't, you know, they all singing, all dancing. <laughs> okay. And was it, how was the audio on it? Good. Yeah. yeah. You, would, you felt you were there, you, you know, it was yeah. around you, you're in the action. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Because yeah, we saw it on Dolby Cinema from here. I could have seen it on IMAX, but... I was trying to get to the first show when it was going to be an 11 o'clock show. So that's what we yeah. went to. I would strongly suggest seeing this in a theater, not streaming it. I think mm. you would lose so much if you streamed this for your first time seeing it. Now, Dolby Cinema means you've got the blackest black when the screen is supposed to be black. It's the blackest black that's out there right now. We had the seat shakers and there's a scene with an avalanche. I'm not going to give away what happens with the avalanche, but there is one. And I'll tell you, those seat shakers really make you really feel like you're in that scene when you see the snow coming down and your your seat shaking like this, and you're you're feeling it, not just seeing it and hearing it, which was which was great. So if you can see this in a theater, not streaming for the first time, because I think at home you'd lose a lot. I also think it'd be a great movie to see in IMAX, especially yeah, the second half second half of the movie. 
and and which also makes me really look forward to No Time to Die because they did some of the filming on that in the IMAX 70 millimeter cameras. So I just really want to see a good action movie done that way. And then how crowded was your theater? We, there were not many people in. It was a, an afternoon showing. We were all spaced out. It was all very, uh, I didn't feel at risk. Okay. <laughs> it was a nice, comfortable afternoon. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Now, had, you been, had you been to the cinema coming out of the pandemic yet? This, is the, this was the first film that I have seen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is the third one I've seen. We saw Tenant when it was released in September. I saw that movie Cliff Walkers. I did a podcast on it, a, a quick fire podcast on it. That one I saw twice. And again, I always go to the first showing. I was the only person in the theater the second time I saw it. Here, the theater was probably 30 to 40% full. So the nice thing about that is you didn't feel crowded. You felt yeah. there was some social distancing, but there were other people to, to hear, see the movie, get their reactions. So Vicky, there was one other thing in this movie that I wanted to talk about that I bet you didn't catch. Did you hear the laugh track? The laugh track. Do you know what I mean by a laugh track? I don't know if they, maybe we have different terms for that. But uh, when they show not a aware of that term. Okay, so no. it's, a, it's a term here in the U.S. at least where when they're showing a movie or a TV show, there's laughter on the tape. We call it canned laughter. Okay, so did you catch the canned laughter? No. Okay, oh. so, so <laughs> I don't want to give this away. But Vicky, you've seen the movie. Once you've seen the movie, search for Yelena or Florence Pugh. There is a scene, they've got a trailer out on it. When I saw it in the movie theater, I thought the people in the audience were laughing. And they may have been, because I was laughing at this one line. It was, it, it's, 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 it's one they kind of touted in some of the, the trailers and stuff coming up. I watched a video of that trailer, and there was laughter in the track. So there was canned laughter in it. Now, maybe it was somebody had filmed it in the theater, but it sure looked like it was a regular trailer cut for me. And there was mm -hmm. laughter. In, it shocked me when mm -hmm. I heard that. So if anybody knows, did I just see a weird trailer of it and it's not really there? <laughs> but it was, and it was in exactly the spot I thought I heard the laughter. Mm, no, I, I saw it in the theater. So Interesting. Yeah. All I can say, Vicky, is you're such a poser. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing about this movie that I wanted to talk about because of James Bond, and that's they released Black Widow in all of their locations on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of the same week. So they staggered the release, but it was within that same weekend. And it meant that I didn't get the spoilers before I saw that movie. For No Time to Die, there are 10 days between when it releases first in Belgium to the time it hits the U.S. And there's no way I'm not going to know what happens by the end of that with social media and all that we do as spy movie fans. Yeah. And I really wish EM Productions would take, especially since you're not going to allow streaming, would take that approach. And I believe No Time to Die probably, especially with the IMAX filming they did, should be seen in a movie theater. Oh, yeah. Definitely. At least yeah. the first time. This movie should be seen in a movie theater for the first time, but make it so we don't get it spoiled before we see it and get these releases closer in timing, at least in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're lucky, Vic, you know, you get a chance to see No Time to Die the second day it's in release. <laughs> so, yeah. it's, and, yes. it's all, and it's in only one location. It's in Belgium the day before. And there's only one country that has it. It's not every, on the day you get it, there's you know, 15 or 16 countries that get it, mm -hmm. I think. All right, so that wraps up our quickfire look at the new Marvel movie, Black Widow. We think this is a spy movie to watch, especially if you can see it in a the theater. And if you're an MCU fan, you'll like it even more. So thanks for listening. This has been Tom Pizzotto. I'm Vicki Hodges. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Subscribe to our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies, right now on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it.